Hi, my name is Shiva Raman from Johns Hopkins University. Now, over the course of this lecture, let's talk a little bit about challenges in detection of transitional cell carcinoma. Now, we're going to really spend some time going over technique and specifically what kind of protocol options you have in terms of CT urography. Now, I'll discuss what we do at Hopkins and our rationale for our protocols, but also give you a sense for some of the other options you might have to choose from. Now, once we've talked about technique, we'll go on to discuss a little bit about a generalized approach to imaging hematuria, including which patients really need a CT scan and which don't. And then finally, we'll spend some time really looking at CT findings, including what you should be looking for when you're trying to diagnose TCC at different parts of the uh, collecting system, including the intrarenal collecting system, the ureters, and the bladder. Now, when you're putting together a CT urography technique, your goal is actually pretty simple. Fundamentally, you're trying to maximize distension of the upper urinary tract with contrast, but do so with the least possible radiation dose. Now, if you look at the literature, there really are three primary protocol options available. Single bolus technique, split bolus technique, and then, theoretically, a triple bolus technique. Now, the single bolus technique is, by far, across the country, the most commonly used technique in, in practice. It is undoubtedly going to be the most effective in terms of maximizing urinary tract distension. And, and if you look at the protocol in detail, you realize why, right? You're giving 120 cc's of contrast, you're acquiring multiple different phases, but the entirety of that contrast dose is actually contributing to excretion. So this protocol is pretty simple. You give the contrast, you acquire arterial and venous phase images at about 25 to 30 and 50 to 60 seconds respectively, and then you acquire excretory phase images between 5 to 8 minutes. Now, because you're acquiring multiple discrete phases, including arterial and venous phases, you are going to have a higher sensitivity for RCC compared to some of the other protocols I'll talk about. But by the same token, you are acquiring at least three phases, sometimes four if you include non-contrast imaging. So it does have a higher radiation dose as a result of that compared to the other protocols. Now, the other major option you have out there, and the, it's used in some institutions, is the split bolus technique. Now, the split bolus technique entails dividing your contrast dose into two and acquiring a combined excretory and nephrographic phase. So if you look at the, the graphic, you see that you would initially administer 50 cc's of omnipaque. You wait uh, about five minutes, then you administer another 80 cc's of contrast. And then at seven minutes, you acquire combined nephrographic and excretory phase images. So because you are combining two of the phases, you are going to reduce radiation dose, of course, because you're acquiring fewer phases of contrast. Now, the problem is, if you look at the protocol, only that initially administered 50 cc's of contrast is actually going to contribute towards the excretion in that uh, delayed phase. So as a result, undoubtedly, you're going to end up with less robust collecting system distension, and that's particularly a problem in the distal ureters, where this technique is known to have problems in terms of distending the distal ureters, and, and that is an issue given that that's the most common location for ureteral TCCs. Now, in theory, another option is something called a triple bolus technique. Now, this is a rare protocol, and to be honest, I've never actually met anyone who uses it in practice, and I think it really is more of a literature or academic thing than a true protocol used out in the community. But just talking about it for completeness sake, the triple bolus technique involves splitting your contrast dose into three separate uh, into three separate administrations. And so you acquire a single combined cortical medullary nephrographic and excretory phase. So you give 30 cc's initially, you wait a few minutes, you give another 50 cc's, you wait a few minutes more, you give another 65 cc's, and then at the end you acquire a single combined phase that gives you cortical medullary nephrographic and excretory uh, phase enhancement. Now because you're acquiring a single phase, of course, you're going to dramatically reduce your radiation dose. But as you can imagine, because only 30 cc's of that initially administered contrast actually contributes towards excretion, you get very poor collecting system distension and opacification. I think there's little doubt that this protocol dramatically reduces your sensitivity for TCC. And because you're not acquiring multiple discrete phases, I think you're going to have trouble catching some of those subtle renal cell carcinomas as well. Now, once you've decided which of those two to three techniques you want to use, the next step is to decide whether you want to use any one of a number of ancillary techniques that have been described in the literature. These are all techniques that some places use, some others don't, and there is some debate about all of these techniques if you look at the literature. So let's go through them one by one, and we'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons of using each technique, and that includes abdominal compression, IV saline, oral hydration, Lasix administration, prone positioning rather than supine, uh, 
and finally using a lower dose of, um, of IV contrast. So let's start with abdominal compression. Now, for those of you who have never used this, this is essentially a band that goes across the abdomen. You, you basically use it to compress the upper urinary tract, so you acquire two different acquisitions. You get one set with the, uh, the band compressing, and that theoretically traps the contrast in the upper urinary tract, in other words, the intrarenal collecting systems and the ureters, and theoretically improves distension and gives you better, uh, uh, a better chance to identify TCCs superiorly, and then you acquire a separate set of images after you release the compression band and the contrast flows distally into the ureters and the bladder. Now, the problem with abdominal compression is that even though all of that sounds great in theory, the problem is that if you look at the literature, it's actually not at all clear that it works. In fact, there's an article in radiology a few years ago that showed that compression really did not do anything significant in terms of improving distension or a pacification of the urinary tract. And I would say that my own experience has been pretty similar. I, I've worked at an institution where these bands were used uh, on every case, and to be honest, I don't think that it made much of a difference. Now, on top of that, it does affect your workflow, so the study takes a little longer, or is at least a little more complicated, because your technologists have to acquire those two sets of images before and after compression. And you also have to be careful in terms of using the band or the compression in patients who have any kind of recent surgery or aortic pathology. It's, it's quite painful or cumbersome to deploy in patients who are obese. Now, putting all that together, I would argue that abdominal compression isn't really worth it and it's kind of more, more of a pro it creates more problems than it actually solves. Now, what about something that actually has been proven to work, and that's IV Lasix? So typically just a small dose of about 10 milligrams has been shown in multiple studies to improve distension of the collecting systems and ureters, and including this article by Silverman et al. in radiology about 10 years ago. They showed that you get significantly better distension uh, when you use saline compared, or when you use Lasix compared to other methods. And that was particularly the case for the distal ureter, which has traditionally always been a problem in terms of getting good distension. Uh, Diuretics not only help you in terms of distension, they also actually help you by diluting out the contrast. So if you look at many IVP studies or urogram studies, the contrast is really dense and even windowing it, it can be trouble, you can have trouble actually seeing through the contrast to identify subtle nodularity or thickening. Diuretics, by diluting out that contrast, can actually make the contrast a little less dense, reduce beam hardening, and honestly make it a little bit easier to see through the contrast to identify true abnormalities. Now the question isn't whether this works or not, because I think it's pretty clear it does work. The question is whether it gives you enough of a benefit to really um, compensate for the fact that this really can create some issues in terms of workflow, especially when you're doing a lot of these studies, right? Obviously, you're, you have to have nursing on staff to administer the medication. You have to take into account Lasix allergies. You have to look at blood pressures, renal function, so on and so forth. So this can create some issues for workflow, both from a technologist and nursing standpoint. And, uh, and for reasons I'll go, go into a little later, this is not something that we routinely do at Hopkins. And um, we feel that it's just not worth it in terms of the impact on workflow. Now, what about prone positioning. So of course we routinely do these supine. What about putting the patients prone? Does that make any difference? In theory, you put the patient prone and you would hope that contrast would accumulate in the proximal collecting system or upper urinary tract and give you better distension. Is that actually the case? And the answer is no. There's a nice study about five or six years ago uh, in clinical imaging showing that supine positioning was clearly superior to prone positioning in terms of a pacifying the pelvic helicele system. Now, on top of that, even if it did work, I would challenge any of you, ostensibly healthy people out there, um, out there in the radiology community, to lie flat on your stomach on a hard CT scanner gantry for at least five to six minutes, right? Uh, I think that's pretty uncomfortable. Honestly, I would not want to do it. And you can imagine we have patients with comorbidities who are obese, who have other issues where prone positioning would be even more problematic and even more uncomfortable for those patient groups. I would strongly recommend avoiding using prone positioning. Just stick, your, stick to the standard supine positioning. So what about something that's pretty easy, oral hydration? Now, this works really well. In fact, this is what we do as Ho at Hopkins, as I'll go into later. And there are multiple studies out there showing that oral hydration works as well, if not better, than any of the other options, including this study by Satomi Kamoto, one of my colleagues. She wrote an article in AJR about 10 years ago showing that oral hydration did as well or better than any of the other alternatives. And so 
to be honest, regardless of whether you pick any of the other alternatives or not, I would strongly recommend that you um, orally hydrate the patient. And we'll, we'll talk about exactly what we do a, a little bit later. Now, what about something a little bit atypical that not many groups do, and that's lowering the contrast um, concentration but giving a higher volume. So in theory, uh, you could give 200 cc's of Omnipec 240 as opposed to 120 cc's of Omnipec 350. Now, that sounds a little unusual, so what's the rationale? Well, in theory, at least the proponents of this, uh, this protocol would argue that by giving a larger volume, you get better distension of the collecting systems and ureters, and because the contrast is less dense, you get less beam hardening, and theoretically a greater ability to see through the contrast and evaluate the lumen. So you might be able to identify subtle nodularity, subtle urothelial thickening a little better. This is something I would strongly urge you against using, okay? Now, the problem with this is that it assumes fundamentally that the only diagnosis you're trying to make on a CT urogram is transitional cell carcinoma. And as far as I'm concerned, that is not true, right? You're, TCC is really one of many different possible diagnoses in a patient with hematuria. And by doing the study this way, you're essentially going to end up with washed out, very grayed out images, very poor contrast opacification, and I think you're going to have real trouble in terms of evaluating the rest of the abdomen and looking at the renal parenchyma. I, I think you'd put yourself at real risk of missing subtle renal cell carcinomas, vascular abnormalities, and other subtleties, uh, subtle diagnoses that we'll talk about later that potentially could explain the patient's symptoms, and instead you're going to be able to, all you're really going to be able to say is yes, there is a TCC, or no, there is not a TCC. So putting all of that together and putting together all the, or talking, uh, considering all those options, what do we do at Johns Hopkins? Well, Dr. Fishman's philosophy regarding CT imaging in general has always been that the most important thing is to get the diagnosis right. Do the study right the first time, and that's really the best way to reduce radiation dose. By doing protocol, by, by using protocols that lower dose but potentially lower image quality, you do run the risk that you don't get the diagnosis and the patient keeps getting imaged over and over again just because you don't, you're never able to arrive at a firm or definitive diagnosis. Our philosophy generally is do the study right, get the clinical, get the answer that allows the patient to be treated adequately, and make sure that they don't need to be scanned over and over again. So as a result, we've decided to go with the single bolus technique. Our argument is that it's the most likely to give you good collecting system distension, so it's great for transitional cell carcinoma. And by the same token, by acquiring multiple discrete phases, arterial, venous, and delayed, you maximize your chances of diagnosing not only renal cell carcinoma, but multiple other uh, pathologies that might potentially explain a patient's hematuria. Now, we also include non-contrast images because we do want to look for stones, which are, of course, another very common cause of hematuria in the ER setting, or in the outpatient setting. But that being said, we definitely do want to consider radiation dose. You do not want to radiate the patient any more than absolutely necessary. And accordingly, we only image those portions of the patient in each phase which are absolutely necessary. So we start with non-contrast images that cover just the abdomen. In that phase, all we're worried about is, are there or are there not intrarenal stones that might be causing hematuria? The arterial phase, subsequently, is going to cover both the abdomen and the pelvis, and that's typically at about 25 seconds after IV contrast. Now, the arterial phase images give you several possible, several advantages, and you're going to look at those, number one, to identify renal cell carcinoma. It is by far the best phase for clear cell RCCs. Number two, it gives you unopacified views of the ureters and bladder, so it is by far the best phase for identifying bladder cancers, as we'll talk about a little later, and it allows you to identify urothelial thickening and hyperenhancement in either ureter. And third, it allows you to identify a number of vascular abnormalities that might potentially cause hematuria, including renal artery aneurysms or renal AV fistulas, or AVMs. We then acquire a, thir a venous phase just covering the abdomen about 60 seconds after IV contrast. It gives you another look at the kidneys to identify renal cell carcinoma, and it gives you um, a good evaluation of all of the solid organs of the upper abdomen. Finally, we acquired delayed excretory phase images about 240 seconds after IV contrast injection, and this covers the entirety of the abdomen and pelvis. And this gives you nice excretory phase images of the intrarenal collecting system, and systems, and the ureters. Now, we talked about a lot of ancillary techniques earlier, and honestly, the only one that we use in our uh, own practice is extensive hydration. So we tell the patient to drink about 1,000 cc's of water immediately prior to the study, and this does a few things. One, 
It improves urinary tract distension. It dilutes out the contrast, so it reduces beam hardening and allows you to see through the contrast to identify subtle abnormalities. It gives you great bladder distension, so particularly in the arterial phase images, you get great bladder distension, and you can see subtle urothelial nodularity or thickening, as well as urothelial hyperenhancement. And accordingly, we also tell the patient not to void for at least an hour prior to the study. And then, of course, drinking water is always great in CT patients who are getting a contrast CT because it reduces the incidence of contrast-induced nephropathy. Now, we give 120 cc's of Omnipake 350, and we obtain our delayed images at about five minutes in most patients. Now, the only reason we go any longer than five minutes is in patients who have an EUPJ obstruction, and in those patients, we wait up to about eight minutes. Now, I would strongly urge you to avoid any longer delay than about five minutes, because the longer you wait, the denser the contrast in the collecting system gets, and the more likely you are to get beam hardening and streak artifact. Now, if you look at studies that have been done with a very prolonged delay, eight minutes, 10 minutes, you can end up with really, really dense contrast, streak everywhere, and to be honest, even though you may get great distension and great opacification, the study is still going to be suboptimal in terms of identifying those subtle early TCCs. Now, I'm not going to go into this too much, but I will say that I think that this is probably the indication for which 3D imaging is the most helpful. Volume rendering, MIP projections can be incredibly helpful in terms of looking at the collecting system, particularly when you're evaluating the delayed excretory phase images. But if you're not using 3D imaging, and, and you should be, at the very least, you've got to look at things in multiple planes. Especially use the coronal multiplanar reformats to look at the intrarenal collecting systems to identify those subtle renal cell carcinomas that are either at the upper pole or the lower pole. I've seen people really get burned on these cases when they just rely on the axial source images alone. And here's some nice examples of MIP and volume rendered reconstructions. So now that we've talked a little bit about protocols, why don't we talk a little bit about who exactly should get a CT scan? And I think a lot of this has to do with what kind of hematuria you have. Now, there is little argument that patients who have macroscopic hematuria are at high risk of malignancy. So if you look at the literature, anywhere between about 3 to 6 percent of patients with macroscopic hematuria will be found to have a urinary tract malignancy, whether it's a transitional cell carcinoma or a renal cell carcinoma. So anybody with macroscopic hematuria essentially should go on to get a formal evaluation, and that entails looking at the bladder with cystoscopy and evaluating the upper urinary tracts, i.e. the ureters and the intrarenal collecting systems, using a CT urogram. Now, microscopic hematuria, on the other hand, is a lot more controversial. And if you look at the literature, different sources will have very different opinions on what exactly should be done. But that being said, it is, it is undoubtedly true that a large percentage of the population, or a significant percentage, somewhere in the order of about 2 to 3 percent, who are asymptomatic and have no underlying pathology, will have microscopic hematuria incidentally. So that means about 1 in 30 or 1 in 50 patients who comes into the emergency room for completely unrelated reasons, if you check a UA, they're going to have microscopic hematuria. And so you have a large group of patients who they're, you're never going to find a cause for an abnormality. And so in other words, patients with microscopic hematuria do not routinely need follow-up. So they do not routinely need a CT scan. Not all of these patients need to get a cystoscopy. These patients, you basically need to take into account who the patient is. So only those patients who have specific risk factors for urinary tract malignancies uh, need a further workup in the setting of microscopic hematuria. Now, there are many, many different causes of hematuria. Not, transitional cell carcinoma is certainly not the only one. So if you look at these causes, there are many different uh, potential etiologies at the level of the kidney, the bladder, the ureter, or even outside the urinary tract. So you're not just looking for TCC. You're looking for renal cell carcinoma, infection, stones, renal vein thrombosis, vascular malformations, papillary necrosis. You're looking for inflamed di bladder diverticulum, obstruction, anticoagulation, prostate abnormality. So you really have to make sure that you don't get tunnel vision. I think all too often when we interpret these studies, a lot of radiologists are just thinking all about TCC, but remember, TCC is one of about 30 different things that you need to consider on your differential diagnosis. But all that being said, this lecture is fundamentally about transitional cell carcinoma, so let's talk a little bit about the imaging findings. Transitional cell carcinoma is not the most common malignancy in the world, right? Relatively rare, certainly more rare than renal cell carcinoma, and tends to be found most often in men, especially elderly men, and the vast majority of these patients will present with hematuria. There are a number of different risk factors, the most potent of which include cigarette smoking, 
certain chemical carcinogens and dyes, cyclophosphamide, analgesic abuse, including phenacetin, and then, in theory, heavy caffeine use. Now, why don't we talk a little bit about the findings of TCC at every single point in the uh, urinary tract. And let's start by looking at the intrarenal collecting system. Now, intrarenal TCCs, for the most part, tend to be small, superficial, and frond-like with a relatively good prognosis. So most patients with intrarenal uh, collecting system TCCs tend to do pretty well. The problem is that there is a small minority of these cancers that end up being infiltrative, that are multifocal, and patients with such malignancies are much more likely to have a poor outcome. Now, regardless of whether you have uh, a TCC with a relatively good prognosis or a bad prognosis, these lesions do have a strong tendency for bilaterality and multifocality. So you see a lesion in one kidney, you really need to look at the other kidney, both ureters, every single point in the collect of the uh, urinary tract very carefully to make sure there's not a second lesion. Now, with regard to the intrarenal collecting system, the most common location for TCCs are actually going to be the renal pelvis, and that makes sense because they actually have the largest area of urethelium within the intrarenal collecting system. Now, what are you looking for? Now, on the arterial phase images, you're looking for urethelial hyperenhancement, usually focal, associated with urethelial thickening and nodularity. And you're going to be able to identify that thickening and nodularity on the delayed excretory phase images as well. You're looking on the excretory phase images for a focally dilated calyx as a result of obstruction by a tumor or an amputated calyx that's been destroyed by an associated mass. Now, when you do see a discrete mass as opposed to just focal urethelial thickening or nodularity, the mass is typically going to be infiltrative and poorly marginated. So it's not going to look like a renal cell carcinoma that's a round ball. It's rather going to look very ill-defined and infiltrative in terms of its morphology. Now, I will admit, I've seen a lot of these now that have been quite subtle. So you have to, you can't, you're not just looking for a large lesion. You've really got to look for some relatively subtle findings. So here's an example of a case in which there is asymmetric mild left-sided hydronephrosis and notice that at the level of the left renal pelvis there is this focal urethelial thickening resulting in a stricture of the pelvis probably over about two centimeters and there's obstruction proximal to the site of stricturing. So this really is the kind of abnormality you're looking for. Any focal urethelial thickening must raise concern for malignancy. Here's another example that I think is even more subtle. Upper pole calyx in the left kidney, notice that there's subtle focal urethelial thickening and nodularity. Clearly, that's abnormal. This turned out to be a renal cell carcinoma. Here's another example. Again, you can see that there's focal soft tissue in the left upper pole. Notice that it's surrounding that left upper pole calyx, which is irregularly narrowed. This turned out to be a small renal cell carcinoma. Now, I will admit, I think that the delayed excretory phase images, at least with regards to the uh, intrarenal collecting system tumors is certainly going to be the best phase in terms, in terms of identifying these lesions. But that being said, there are going to be cases where it may be obvious or may be most diagnosable on either the arterial or venous phase images. Here's an example where you can see the lesion on the uh, cortical medullary phase images, but it's more obvious on the delayed images. Notice how there's destruction and irregularity of that upper pole calyx on the right. But the mass in the upper pole on the cortical medullary phase images which is highlighted by the arrow, relatively subtle, right? Very easy to miss. It just blends in with the adjacent medullary pyramids. Now, as I mentioned, these lesions have a strong tendency for multifocality and bilaterality. So identifying a single lesion doesn't mean that your job is done. Identifying a single lesion just means you need to look doubly hard at the rest of the urinary tract to identify a second or a third lesion. So here's an example where you can see that there is extensive multifocal disease, right? So I've shown you a single axial slice where there are at least two nodules within the renal pelvis, but if you look at the coronal MIP reconstructions from the excretory phase, there are actually extensive lesions throughout the right collecting system and possibly in the left collecting system as well. Now, not everything that looks like your... Uh, TCC necessarily is transitional cell carcinoma. There are certain mimics on imaging. I'd say the most important mimic is probably lymphoma, which can look very similar as an ill-defined infiltrative mass involving the kidney, but that being said, typically is associated with other stigmata of lymphoma. So you're going to see uh, lymphadenopathy and maybe other sites of extranodal disease.
Metastatic disease, in theory, can uh, mimic TCC. And I've only seen this a few times, but every once in a while you'll see a colon cancer or a breast cancer or a prostate cancer that goes to the kidney. I'd, I've seen quite a few infiltrating variants of RCC, or renal cell carcinoma, that have looked for all the world like a transitional cell carcinoma. They involved the collecting system. They were ill-defined, poorly marginated. And then finally, in theory, xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. Now, the second compartment of the urinary tract that I want to talk about is the ureter. Now, identifying ureteral TCCs can be really a big problem. Now, fortunately for us, the, this is pretty rare, not that common, and so this isn't something that's going to come up every day. But when it does, I will admit, it can be, present quite a challenge for the radiologist. Now, ureteral TCCs can occur anywhere in the ureter, but the vast majority of lesions, at least three-fourths of all lesions, occur in the distal ureter. And that's part of why these are so problematic to diagnose, because the distal ureter is the most difficult portion of the ureter to consistently distend and well visualize, even when you're using the best of technique. Now, most ureteral tumors are going to be TCCs, but rarely you'll see a ureter involved by metastatic disease or lymphoma, but not that common. Now, the findings of uh, TCC in the ureters are very akin to those that you're going to find in the intrarenal collecting system. Urethelial thickening, especially thickening that's focal or nodular. Abnormal urethelial hyperenhancement, again, especially when it's focal or in conjunction with urethelial thickening and nodularity. Calcifications of the ureters, in particular calcifications in the wall of the ureter rather than ureteral stones. Periureteral fat stranding, which is a finding that we typically associate with infection, but can be seen in the setting of uh, extramural spread of tumor. And then, of course, if you're lucky, of discrete filling defect or mass, which makes it relatively easy to make the diagnosis. Now, one thing I do try to tell our residents and fellows is that treat the ureters a lot like you would treat the bowel. So when you're looking at a bowel obstruction, you're trying to find a site of transition, right? You look for proximally obstructed, uh, dilated small bowel, distally decompressed small bowel, and then somewhere in the middle is going to be a site of transition, and then you interrogate the site of transition trying to find an obstructing mass or tumor. And that, that's very much going to be the same approach when you're looking at the ureters. Look for a site of transition between dilated and decompressed ureter, and at that site, you're going to look for any focal nodularity or thickening that more, might portend the presence of a tumor. And this has also been described as the so-called goblet sign that we all learned during, um, in uh, fluoroscopy. Now, these ureteral TCCs can be really difficult and really subtle. Here's an example that looks obvious when I point an arrow at it, and I give you the exact right slice to look at. But you can see that this is not a dramatic finding, right? There is focal irregularity and thickening along the medial wall of that left mid ureter. Maybe there's a little bit of a stricture there, but honestly, that could just be peristalsis. You can imagine that this is the kind of finding that would be very easy to overlook, right? I can imagine many, many radiologists are not going to see that. So you've really got to be on the lookout in these patients with hematuria, not just for obvious findings, obvious signs of obstruction, because sometimes you're looking for subtle thickening, and many of these patients may not have evidence of proximal obstruction. Here's another example. Now, if you look at this coronal MIP reconstruction on the left, well, there's an area that's unopacified in the proximal ureter. On the, sorry, on the right, there's an area that's unopacified. Is that real? Is that a stricture, or am I potentially just dealing with peristalsis? Well, maybe the right-sided collecting system is a little more dilated compared to the left, but not unequivocally so. But then you look at the uh, source images and you see that there really is focal soft tissue at the site of stricturing. This turned out to be another ureteral TCC. Here's maybe the most subtle case that I've seen over the last couple of years. Now, this is a patient who actually had, had long-standing hematuria, had, as far as I know, been scanned at least five or six times at virtually every hospital in, uh, uh, in the surrounding area never had the diagnosis made. No one could figure out why this patient had hematuria. One of my colleagues looked at the study and noticed that, well, maybe there's a little bit of a ragged edge along the medial aspect of that left proximal ureter. Why don't I look at the source images a little more carefully? And then if you look really carefully, there's very subtle thickening along that medial ureter. And this turned out to be a ureteral TCC. That's how subtle these cases can be. That's how hard it can be to make this diagnosis. So you've really got to be on the lookout for those subtle findings. Now, here's a case that nicely illustrates what I was talking about earlier in terms of periureteral fat stranding. Now, classically, when you think of the periureteral fat stranding, we all first start thinking about infection. And in most cases, that's what you're dealing with. But when you see a focal stricture 
focal urethelial thickening with focal periureal fat stranding that can be seen in the, in the setting of tumor. And usually when you have a tumor and you see surrounding fat stranding, it means that you're dealing with the extramural spread of tumor into the surrounding fat. Now, another finding that can be helpful is neovascularity. Now, as, as you all know, transitional cell carcinoma is a tumor that can be relatively vascular on the arterial phase. And so if you're looking at arterial phase imaging, not uncommonly you'll see focal urethelial hyperenhancement. And for some tumors, you can actually see tumor vessels or neovascularity feeding the ureter at that site, as in this case. And so in cases like this, when you see true neovascularity associated with the ureter, you have to really, really worry about the possibility that you're dealing with a neoplasm. Finally, this is the kind of tumor you, we'd all want to see, right? This is easiest to identify, not difficult to make diagnosis, focal filling defect. Unfortunately, in my experience, this is the least common appearance for ureteral transitional cell carcinomas. Most cases are not going to be this easy. Now, as I mentioned earlier, treat the ureter like you do the small bowel. Look for site of transitions. Here's the classic goblet sign, right? Proximal ureter dilated, filled with urine. The distal ureter is decompressed and narrowed. There is a goblet shape right at the site of transition. This is a classic finding for transitional cell carcinoma. We're all used to identifying this finding on, your, on uh, classic fluoroscopic studies, but it's a finding that you are going to be able to make on um, CT as well. So why don't we end by talking about the bladder, which to me is actually one of the most important parts of our evaluation on CT, but honestly is something that we tend to ignore all the time. Now, bladder cancer is actually quite common. Unlike the other tumors I talked about in the intrarenal collecting system and the ureters, this is something that we see all the time. It is the fourth most common malignancy in men, 10th most common malignancy in women, and you're talking about somewhere in the order of 60,000 new cases every year. Now, the vast majority of bladder cancers are TCCs, but there are other histologies possible, including squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. Now, as with other portions of the, collect of the urinary tract, most of these lesions are superficial with a good prognosis, but there are aggressive forms, and when they metastasize, the prognosis is actually very poor, somewhere in the order of 5% at two years. Now, all too often, I'll hear residents and fellows say, well, I didn't really look at the bladder that well because, you know, after all, it's not our job to look at the bladder on a CT scan. They're going to get a cystoscopy anyway. That is the farthest from the truth that I think you could be. Yes, these patients with macroscopic hematuria should get cystoscopy. And yes, I will admit it is the gold standard in terms of identifying bladder cancers. But that does not obviate our responsibility for looking at the bladder. You've got to remember, patients who come into the ER with hematuria and get a CT scan well, a lot of those patients, how many of them are actually going to end up with a cystoscopy? How many of them are lost to follow-up? So if you're able to make the diagnosis of a potential bladder cancer on a CT scan, you really can speed up that patient's diagnosis. And in some patients who might have not gotten a cystoscopy because they were lost to follow-up, you might be able to make sure that those patients are uh, better dealt with. Now, even, even if you assume that cystoscopy is a better modality, I think you shouldn't sell CT short in terms of identifying bladder cancers. There's a nice study in radiology from 2008 that showed that the sensitivity and specificity of CT for bladder cancer, better than you think, not bad, right? Somewhere in the order of a sensitivity of 79% and a specificity of 94%. So this is definitely a diagnosis that we can make on a CT scan. And, you know, interestingly, Dr. Fishman, has always been interested by this particular diagnosis. And we've gone back and looked, and it's amazing how many bladder cancers there are that radiologists just don't see, right? And I think if you go back in retrospect and you look at a lot of CT scans, you can see that those bladder cancers are there to identify. It's just that we assume they're going to be found on cystoscopy, so we don't look hard enough. So always make this a part of your search pattern. Look carefully at the bladder and make sure that you're not missing a subtle tumor in a patient with hematuria. Now, what do bladder cancers look like? Now, there is some variability in terms of how much they enhance, but generally, most bladder TCCs will enhance avidly early and are going to be best identified on the early phase images. Now, this is one of the reasons why our protocol at Hopkins entails getting arterial phase images through the entirety of the abdomen and pelvis, because we want to look at the bladder in the arterial phase. Subtle nodularity, subtle bladder wall thickening, arterial hyperenhancement, much easier to see on the arterial phase images where there's unopacified urine within the bladder as opposed to the delayed images. Now, on the delayed images, yes, you may be able to see a discrete filling defect, but in general, I found that the delayed images are quite poor in terms of identifying most bladder tumors. Now, 
one of the reasons we, because we put so much stress on identifying bladder tumors in our practice, we actually, the, we actually uh, have designed our protocol in such a way as to maximize bladder distension. So obviously, as I mentioned before, we hydrate the patients prior to the study, which does obviously increase distension. But we also instruct the patients not to void prior to the study for at least one hour, again, to make sure that the bladder is as distended as possible, allowing us to identify subtle tumors. Now, what are you looking for? You're looking for pretty much the same things you were more superiorly in the urinary tract. You're looking for focal asymmetric wall thickening, a focal mass, a small filling defect, or any calcification. Remember, calcification is a finding often associated with TCC, so any calcification within the bladder wall itself should always raise concern from malignancy. Now, I will say that you don't want to be overcalling it, though. I mean, yes, you want to be sensitive and you want to look for bladder cancers, but you have to realize that not everyone with a thick bladder necessarily has a malignancy. In particular, what you're looking for is asymmetric focal wall thickening. Diffuse wall thickening is really common, and, and in most cases, it's just because the bladder is inadequately distended, but if it, if it is real, it's usually on the basis of something inflammatory. So it could be cystitis, or it could be chronic uh, thickening as a result of bladder outlet obstruction, or it could be someone with a neurogenic bladder. So if I see diffuse thickening, I'm not going to re uh, recommend a cystoscopy. I'm only going to recommend that cystoscopy when I see thickening that's focal. So. Cases like this where you see a focal nodular mass or polyploid mass tend to be relatively easy, right? I will say, though, that I, I still think that these kind of lesions are easier to identify on the arterial phase compared to the, uh, to the delayed phase. In the delayed phase, if you get contrast pooling in the wrong way, small filling defects can be hard to see. Larger lesions like this are going to be obvious, but I think most bladder cancers are easiest to identify on the arterial phase. Large lesions like the last one, everyone's going to make the diagnosis. These are the kind of lesions that I've seen missed. Small nodules in that 5 millimeter, 1 centimeter range. Very difficult to identify if you don't take the time to actually look at the bladder specifically. And in this case, you can see that it's an obvious tumor, right? Uh, there's really no doubt that that's going to end up being a neoplasm. But you just have to take the time to actually look at the bladder. My one recommendation would be also, don't just rely on the axials. The axial plane can make it quite difficult in certain positions to see the uh, to see uh, to see tumors, especially tumors that are right underneath the superior wall of the bladder or at the very base of the bladder. So look at the coronal or sagittal reformats as well. Now here's a nice example illustrating why I think the arterial phase images in general are better for identifying bladder tumors than the excretory phase. If you look at the uh, the image on the right, you can see that there's a nodule or nodular mass along the posterior wall of the bladder, fairly obvious in the arterial phase. I think it's more subtle on the, on the delayed phase. You've got contrast there. There's some streak artifact. It's just a little more difficult to identify. So I tend to concentrate, when I'm looking at the bladder at least, mostly on the arterial phase. Here's another pretty subtle case. Notice that on the excretory phase images, you know, hard to say anything for certain. Portions of the bladder wall are obscured by that dense contrast, especially along the lateral bladder walls. But notice on the arterial phase that there's focal wall thickening at a couple of sites, left lateral wall, probably right anterior bladder, and each of those two sites is associated with subtle urothelial hyperenhancement. This is how subtle some of these tumors can be. You see something like this, you've got to recommend that the patient go on to get cystoscopy. Now, here's a nice example illustrating the avid vascularity of bladder tumors. Now, this is not a difficult mass to diagnose, but notice that there's lots of vascularity, there's enhancement, there's some tumor vessels feeding the lesion. These are fundamentally hypervascular lesions, and as a result, they tend to enhance most avidly and be most conspicuous on the arterial phase. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a real proponent of looking at the bladder in multiple planes. Here's an example where if you look at the axial image, it looks pretty normal to me. And, and you can scroll up and down, and I think the axial images were not uh, completely convincing. But if you look at the coronal images, either in the arterial phase or in the delayed excretory phase, you see that, that there is wall thickening, and it's relatively focal. It's just involving the right lateral bladder wall. The rest of the bladder looks normal. And of course, as a helpful contributory feature, there's a uh, right-sided hydronephrosis and hydroureter. So this is a bladder cancer that is much easier to diagnose when you're looking at a coronal reformat. Now, calcification anywhere in the urothelium is problematic and should at least raise the possibility of a TCC. Now, of course, you do not want to confuse an actual intramural or wall calcification with a stone. Stones are going to layer within the bladder. They're going to be within the lumen, as opposed to these calcifications that are actually within the wall of the bladder or within a mass. Any calcification that you can't explain probably needs to be worked up. Now, here's an example where there's a discrete polyploid mass, and notice that there are some punctate calcifications associated with the lesion.
Now, before we end, let me just stress that I think all too often we tend to get tunnel vision. We think a lot about transitional cell carcinoma when we're dealing with hematuria, but don't forget that there are many, many other diagnoses that you need to be considering. The risk factors for all urologic malignancies share a lot in common. So just remember that TCCs are not the most common uh, urologic malignancy, renal cell carcinoma is, and both of those uh, cancers share a lot of risk factors, including smoking, older age, hematuria, and so on and so forth. So as far as I'm concerned, these CT urograms are just as important for identifying RCCs as they are TCCs, and that's one of the reasons why our protocol is designed the way it is. We acquire multiple discrete phases, and we have all of the phases that you need to identify those subtle, small renal cells, especially the clear cell RCCs that tend to be most evident on either the arterial or the delayed phase images. We also acquire non-contrast images. Just remember, renal stones are way more common than transitional cell carcinoma. So you've got to be on the lookout for stones, not only in the collecting systems, but also with the intrarenal collecting systems, but also the ureters and the bladder. And so remember, you're looking for stones in the kidneys on the non-contrast images, and you're going to use the arterial phase images through the entirety of the abdomen and pelvis for unopacified views of the ureters and the bladder to identify stones in those locations. Infection is really common. Again, way more common than transitional cell carcinoma. So you're looking for di di uh, diffuse bladder wall thickening, often with perivesicular fat stranding and urethelial hyperenhancement. And you may see evidence of ascending urinary tract infections as well. Notice in this case, both ureters are diffusely thickened. They're hyperemic, avidly enhancing. But notice how this process is diffuse and bilateral, very unlikely to represent a tumor because of its diffuse nature. This is almost certainly going to be infectious. Pyelonephritis, infection of the renal parenchyma, can also give you hematuria. Notice in this case that you have wedge-shaped hypoenhancement, striated nephrograms suggesting that you have renal infection. Now, one diagnosis that I think people miss all the time that actually un not uncommonly can cause hematuria is renal AVMs. And I, I remember I first saw this a few years ago, and I made the diagnosis, and I thought, well, that's strange. You know, I, I've never seen that before. And honestly, over the last two or three years, I think I've made this diagnosis four or five times. It must be much more common than we think, and honestly, it's not a diagnosis that's going to be very easy to make unless you have arterial phase imaging. But notice in this example, this patient had had chronic unexplained hematuria, and you can see that there's a strange tangle of vessels. This is a renal AVM, very easy to deal with for the interventional radiologist once you make the diagnosis, but some of the protocol options I talked about earlier, if you don't have arterial phase imaging as part of your protocol, this is a diagnosis that you're going to miss. Here's a Another diagnosis that can cause hematuria that you might miss without arterial phase imaging. Here's a right renal artery aneurysm. Patient was presenting with hematuria. Again, not that difficult to deal with, provided that you're able to make the diagnosis. So in summary, to me the key to this whole lecture and this whole topic is really technique. If you don't have the right technique, it is going to be virtually impossible for you to make subtle diagnoses. So figure out what kind of protocol options you want to use, how you're going to ensure that you maximally distend the collecting system, maximally evaluate the renal parenchyma for renal cell carcinomas, but do all of that with the least possible radiation dose. Secondly, I think people tend to focus too much on the delayed images. Yes, the delayed images are important, particularly, I think, for intrarenal collecting system tumors. But as far as I'm concerned, we tend to pay too little attention to the arterial phase, which I think is probably the most important phase. For identifying tumors of the bladder, identifying tumors of the ureters, the arterial phase is absolutely critical, and it's also going to be the best phase to identify clear cell renal cell carcinomas. Finally, as I mentioned many times during this lecture, TCC is not the only cause of hematuria. And if you treat your CT urograms as purely an exercise in identifying TCCs, you are going to miss many other potentially treatable etiologies of hematuria, and some of which can have a significant impact on patient morbidity and mortality. And for that reason, I would strongly advise you to follow a protocol similar to ours, a full four-phase protocol in patients who have gross hematuria, because that's going to allow you the best chance of identifying the full gamut of different diagnoses that might be causing the patient's symptoms. So that's all I have. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys later.